Prime Minister ends four-day visit to Eastern Highlands and Morobe. Settlers say law and order issues are a result of poor leadership. And women associations receive support for SME. This is National MTV News with Dennis Orere. Good evening. This is Sunday's News. The Prime Minister has ended a hectic four-day visit to the Eastern Highlands and Morro Bay. On the back of a visit to Eastern Highlands on Thursday, he spent Friday night in the Deputy Prime Minister's village in Buang and attended church in the morning. He launched a 10 million kina road project and a commitment for a new corrections facility in Mumeng. Coming off a helicopter late yesterday, he said he was pleased with the visit. On Saturday morning, the PM came out of a church service and went straight into a pre-flight safety briefing with six ministers who accompanied him. Do you have to exit the aircraft? This was his first official trip to Buang. He spent Friday night at the Deputy Prime Minister's village. And then the party travelled in two helicopters to the Hidden Valley Mine for a visit. The government recently approved an extension of the mine licence and for the coffers at Treasury. Thank you, Lion. Thank you, thank you. It is important to keep this mine going as government prepares to bring the Wafi Golpu project into operation. The PM came out pleased with the COVID-19 screening and vaccination facility. For me, just to get here, I had to, I had to do my swipe uh, to ensure that my PCR test was done. Uh, that reflects how serious they are. First case came from Hidden Valley. The company has since stepped up its efforts, creating a COVID bubble for all its workers. Lens Minister clear, I'm Sanab Sanam, he talked to me, give instructions, finish them. Outside, the PM spoke to the workers about plans to make available land allotments outside of Leif for workers who want to get financing to build homes. This is expected to ease a tiny bit of the housing crisis. Give me no blow, you lost Salim Gennar, but you enter into a program that you can go, whether you got money, you had make him house, you no got money, people put him 4% for 40-year program on the BSP. But for PNG, 80% still in rural, rural areas, pockets of a rural community. And this is where also the resource, both human resource and natural resources. So, uh, going to uh, Waubulolo was not just an ordinary visit. Waubulolo is an important economic district. On the political front, both Morobe and the Eastern Highlands are important for any government, with 10 and 9 MPs respectively. It is in any party leader's interest to secure support from these two provinces before the elections. Other parties are also in Morobe as they forge relations ahead of 2022. Scott Wyde, National MTV News, Lay. Representatives of the evicted settlers of Alotau have raised concerns on the current law and order issues in Alotau. They say the law and order problem is a result of poor leadership displayed by their provincial leaders. They also appeal to the leaders to work together to restore peace and good order in Alotau. The representatives of the settlers of Alata were speaking to the media when announcing a restraining order issued by the National Court restraining the Milan Bay Provincial Administration and the police from carrying out eviction on settlers. Their decision to evict these settlers comes after criminals raided Alatau town and burnt down a police barracks. They say law and order problems in Alata is a result of poor leadership. Apart from other issues that have been raised, I, I am very, very concerned on the leadership in the province. I think in the past couple of years we have seen a leadership vacuum in the provincial government and I think this is the issue that has given rise to uh, a lot of uh, unwanted issues that are rising now. Paulus Mumna is one of the plaintiffs representing the settlers of Alatau in this case. He says Milan Bay province was once a quiet and peaceful province. However, in recent years, the rise in law and order problem has caused chaos in Alatau town with people living in fear. He says that is the result of leaders serving their own interest. If the provincial government was running good, all the national leaders, uh, the presidents, if they were working together and if they were holding meetings regularly, accordingly, holding PEC meetings, uh, assembly meetings regularly, they would have cited problems that are going to appear in front of them. That would not be, be wanted. Huh? 
I believe the, these things would have been uh, suppressed already. They further raised concerns on their decision to evict settlers in and around Alotau town. They say this decision will not solve the law and order problems, but will cause more social problems in societies. They appeal to all leaders to work together with the people to restore peace and good order. What if they end up there without consulting their families? They don't have gardens there. They're going to rely on the village people. They said, you've been living in town all these years and we're not going to feed you. So these kind of social problems are going to appear from the wharf all the way to the villages they're going. That when we do things on our own, um, excluding the people themselves, we will always get it wrong. But if we are able to include the people in any discussions whatsoever, we may be able to solve problems without resorting to something like this. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Lawyers representing the settlers of Alotau have appealed to the Lands Department and Milnbay Provincial Administration to disclose maps and documentation showing boundaries of state leases within Alotau Township. They say they must also disclose how and when these portions of land were acquired by the state and from which customary landowners. This is because the eviction and repatriation exercise in Alotau had the scope of affecting people living on customary land. We call in on the, we make in certain calls to the authorities and especially the Mill Bay Provincial Administration and the Lens Department to come forward and disclose maps and documentation showing the boundaries of all state leases in Alotau Town. And if these portions of land were acquired by the state, the question is when did they acquire them and how? Uh, the law says, uh, 97% of, of, of land in this country is owned by customary owners. Uh, so there's about 3%, the number must have, sorry, the percentage could have gone up to 4% now in light of recent acquisitions, but uh, substantial uh, volume of land in this country is held by customary owners. The state cannot just go into uh, an area and, and claim uh, if people have claims to that land. And uh, we, we own the instructions that we have, these directives not only affect people living on state land, but it has, they have the scope of affecting people who are also residents of customary land. And uh, I think, or in our uh, view, uh, the state may be going too far if it's encroaching or touching on property that belongs to someone else. So we call in on the, the provincial administration to, to come up with documentation to show the boundaries of, of all the state leases in town, and that will help us determine whether some of these people who are complaining now are actually squatting on state land or otherwise. Seventeen women association groups in the two-mile area of Mosby South Electorate received SME support from local MP Justin Kachenko. A total of 3 million kina allocated in the DSIP for SME will be rolled out to engage the women of Mosby South to participate in such SME activities. Congratulations! It was all smiles on their face as they walked up to get their capital. The money received will help them start up SME activities. This is an initiative aimed at empowering women of Mosby South to engage in the business sector. Similar programs will also be conducted in other parts of the electorate for those women associations that have registered. This is only Two Mile Hill and then we've also got Connie, Calgary, Six Mile Saraga, Joyce Bay, Sabama. We're empowering every woman in Mosby South. So far, over 30,000 women from Mosby South have registered, 30,000. Now that just shows you the amount of interest that women have to be empowered economically and that they can be part of all the projects and programs of Mosby South. Majority of the groups that received funds resided Two Mile Hill. Amongst them were Goilala Madas. Minister Chachenko, whilst emphasizing on engaging women in business activities, said having a safe community is vital for SMEs to grow in order to have positive economic outcomes. It's not easy for them. We've got law and order issues. All the women from uh, our Goilala communities were also here. They understand that we must have a safe and sound community. We must remove the criminal elements 
the criminals from the community, to make the community safe to live in. Very important. So for our Goilala women to be here today, they have received this uh, seed capital as well as all the other ethnic groups that live in that two mile three, uh, Ward 3A area. So it's about bringing everybody together, me as their member, working in partnership with them for the benefit of the, themselves, their families, and especially the community. With 3 million kina allocated under the SIP for SMEs, this program will be rolled out annually. We look forward to those 17 women associations from Ward 3A coming back in the next 12 months with their success stories, telling us what they've done with their seed capital and how they've used that for the benefit of the women of Mosby South. Suli Suli, National MTV News. National MTV News continues with this Sunday's A Closer Look into the Coffee Price Support Program. Details after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. The coffee industry was given 10 million kina to support price incentives and interventions under the government's COVID-19 stimulus package. The Coffee Industry Corporation's acting CEO, Charles Dambui, said the idea was to give funding support to licensed operators who will ensure the prices reach the farmers. 35 licensed coffee mill operators received this support along with 17 coffee cooperatives in 11 provinces. While the higher prices have encouraged a lot of farmers to continue producing the crop, the farmers and operators are questioning whether or not the government will continue giving this price support. Coffee is a major industry in Papua New Guinea. More than 2 million smallholder farmers are involved in coffee production, mainly in the Highlands region. This industry alone brings in more than 400 million kina from exports annually. Last year, less than 700,000 bags were exported. According to the Coffee Industry Corporation's acting chief executive officer, Charles Stambui, this was the lowest number of exports due to COVID-19. Uh, last year we exported around 687,000 bags. That was the lowest. And of course, it, it, it's not only PNG that we exported. That all the producing countries around the world uh, that will experience, and it's at the back of COVID-19. And it affects the supply system, actually. In November 2020, the government through the Department of Agriculture and Livestock introduced the Price Support and Agriculture Intervention Program under the COVID-19 stimulus package. 50 million kina was allocated for this program and shared amongst the various agriculture sectors. 10 million kina was given to coffee. Mr. Dambui said the idea is to give funding support to licensed operators for both wet and dry meals who will ensure the price reaches the farmers. This is being done using the coffee industry's regulatory policy guidelines and CIC Act. So coffee industry corporation we have taken on board and the only conduit that we can use are our registered operators that includes wet meal and dry meal processors and one or two big uh, cooperative groups that are supplying big uh, processors. 35 licensed coffee operators and 17 cooperatives in the four regions around the country are recipients under the program. The operators of both dry and wet meals were given the price support subsidy, starting with 50,000 kina. One of them is the last Malo coffee factory just outside of Goroka town. They have suppliers from all over the eastern highlands and currently buy coffee parchment for five kina per kilo. With one kina added from the price support funding, the farmers go home with six kina per kilo. The managing director, Ken Dumundi, said this initiative compensates the coffee farmers' hard work. Time you talk about gold, na all this na. I'm all one one, all head man that's all sexy, but time you talk about coffee, I'm all lingling my kilo house line to get money. So me like to thank you, lo, Gaman, lo, James, Marapena, 
um, same Basil where only can support him or legally man inside the house right now. Uh, give him money, go to CIC, or help him plan. Right. Long, uh, the first lot of payment, uh, 50,000 I'll give him. So we plan talking all. 50,000 so. Me plan pay me go on a time, 50,000 and pennies now. We plan go back, long, normal door price plan, plan. Like it goes back to 5K again. So, Lord Islam, me look at me, time old man, like benefit, and me talk to me. Some plan where like a uh, road and problem, but. What also making me, if they can only can come long, try early, can long morning long, come long, at least long current coffee come long can benefit long this lah. About 60 kilometers from Goroka town is the Congo Coffee Factory in Chuave, Chimbu province. The managing director, Jerry Kapka, has been in the coffee business for 30 years. He started off buying coffee and is now the biggest nationally owned coffee exporter in the country. Mr. Kapka said the price support program has encouraged farmers to continue growing the crop, seeing that they now have a higher price. You know, uh, there are many ways of uh, trying to support and grow the agriculture se sector, including coffee. And price support is just only one. Uh, you can work with the farmers. You can work with the uh, uh, coffee growers, you can work with the uh, uh, you know, local coffee uh, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, people, coffee buyers, factory owners, and wet factory owners, and, and uh, exporters. You have to work with them. You know, there are many ways uh, in which you know, the government can look at to, uh, to support the industry. So we have increased production and uh, increased uh, improved quality. And, you know, we want to go from 1 million to 5 million. So we got plenty of this stuff. In the Jiwaka province, Kosim Coffee is one of the operators paying out the price subsidy to farmers. Some of the suppliers come from as far as Middle Ramo in the Medang province. Abraham Ben is one of the farmers who's seen price support being paid for his coffee. Amigo Section 5, can I get up to 550? And Now I'm a price of what comes, so I'm a at the moment now. So I'm a mass, but I'm a little thing, I think by Stabo Semo. I'm a little thing now. Kosem Coffee's managing director, Mark Munol, said the price support is helping farmers get more money for their coffee and is encouraging them to bring in their coffee despite the remoteness of the area they come from. However, Munol said the quality has dropped due to the lack of infrastructure, including roads and bridges. And the biggest obstacle for them is now infrastructure and the cost of transportation, bringing coffee out. For example, like I said, um, five kina per kilo. It's like and now we're offering like five kina, six kina. It's like they're getting one kina. That's the real, reality of it. Okay, people from Jimmy coming to Barnes to sell coffee, it's like um, 50 to 60 kina per bag, which would be like 20 to 30 toya per kilo. So that's going out. And then when it's raining, they can't move the coffee out. So they're hearing there's a price support and good, good coffee, I mean money for price. But um, infrastructure is a really big issue for us in the rural area. You know? And then when people leave the coffee for longer periods, when they bring it out, we want to offer them the best price, but we cannot because of the quality. So we have to reduce price. Uh, so yeah, that's a real issue for us. The wet meals have also been given funds for the price support program, like the Arakil coffee meal in Jiwaka. Unlike the parchment price, wet meals buy cherries for 1 kina 20 to 1 kina 60 per kilo. With the price support program, 50 to 60 toya is being added depending on the factory door price per kilo, bringing prices to 2 kina. The managing director of Arakil Coffee, Paul Pora, said the higher prices is what attracts a lot of coffee farmers, which has been good for operators as well. They've got coffee. Coffee is not the only crop they grow. They grow other things as well. And particularly from this part of the you know, country, like having the market access nearby and land that they can grow, other things that can generate them income quicker. Some of people have you know, dug up their coffees and they're doing vegetables, cocoa, other things that they can 
get quick money, but now with this price support coming in, people are going back to clean the coffee gardens. I've heard stories about some farmers going back and working on their gardens and thinking, you know, thinking they will continue to get this kind of price support. Or maybe they are, you know, they increase level of prices. So I think it's a good thing that this government has done. All the governments have talked about agriculture and coffee and other things, but they've never really actually put money into the hands of the farmers. This is the very first time that we have, you know, had this kind of thing happening. For the 10 million kina given to the coffee industry, 8 million kina was allocated to price support incentives and 2 million kina was given to interventions. Interventions include assisting cooperative groups with nurseries. This nursery at Warala in Jiwaka province was supported with 100,000 kina from CIC to start this nursery of 62,000 coffee seedlings. People are thinking, people are people are ground. Now, come on in, come inside. Now, seven thousand ground. Now, come up with one blah. Nursery, blong all that. CIC. Now, you know, blong people can supply and plant the coffee. Think blong people, blong people can go and blong one million coffee. Now, supply blong not waki. Even though one of my place all coffee or molly, kissim na or only planting. Now, me try blong and people can supply all. Come on in, make them good. Now, I mean, give poly bag. Now, set cloth. Now, long some blong labor work. Come on in, make them good. Now, me blong pay. Now, make them work blong. Get up nursery. According to CIC's acting CEO, Charles Dambui, they started rolling out the price support program for coffee in February when coffee production picked up. Within four months of implementation, the funds have almost been depleted and farmers and operators are questioning if the price support will continue. Congo Coffee's Jerry Kapka said the farmers have benefited greatly, however, a few months is not enough to gauge the success of the program. While he says it should continue, there should be better planning for these funds in the future. Uh, it, it is making a difference, but it has to continue. Uh, you may plan good now, continue, because you're not supporting, you're supporting the little men in the village. It's a good plan, it's a good thing, uh, but let's plan it properly and do it, because I think it will really you know, give us the desired results. But like everything, it doesn't ever happen overnight. Uh, uh, one year, two years past them, but you may look like long up, so you may plan good now, you may work it. Agriculture Minister John Simon said it is a government initiative and it will continue based on the reports that are gathered from the initial funding support. We're going to change the way we're doing things in this country. We can't do it the way we've been doing. It's nearly 50 years now and nothing is moving. So we are now doing it through price support. Okay. If you say you're a farmer, you bring your copra. Where is your money? Your money is with copra now. When you hang your copra on the scale, your real price is 60 toya or one kina, and your member is saying, I'm putting 40 toya, one kina 40. I said, good, I'm putting 60 toya, two kina. So that's the support we're giving you. That is your free money. For the first time, you're going to get free money from your district and from the government. When we return, we bring you stories making headlines overseas. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Turning overseas, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has warned his government to be prepared for both dialogue and confrontation with the U.S. It's his first direct comments on President Joe Biden's administration. Kim Jong-un holds all the power in North Korea, and because that power includes nuclear weapons, his every public appearance is scrutinized for clues to what is really going on inside his hermit kingdom. One thing for sure, he's losing weight. CBS News consultant Bob Carlin has watched Kim battle obesity over the years. He was um, pretty seriously overweight, and now he's heading back down. You can see it not just in his face, but on his wrist, where his watch band seems to have been taken in another notch. Is he simply leading a more healthy lifestyle, or are his genes starting to catch up with him? Both his grandfather and his father died of uh, heart problems. In his speech, Kim said North Korea must remain ready for war. But he also seemed ready for negotiations with the Biden administration. He talked about 
what he's called the evolving policy of the new U.S. administration. He sounds as if he's saying things are moving in the right direction. But U.S. intelligence has warned, quote, Kim remains strongly committed to nuclear weapons. These efforts could include the resumption of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missile testing. Kim's real intentions remain a mystery, but it's safe to say that while he is losing weight, he is also gaining nuclear weapons. Ibrahim Raisi is widely expected to become Iran's next leader with results from the presidential poll. But turnout has been low after a number of moderate and reformist candidates were barred from running. Here's the man likely to be Iran's next president. Ibrahim Raisi, a hardliner and protege of the supreme leader whose supporters are mainly working class and conservative. When we asked one of them why she liked him, an election official interrupted. What are you saying to her? To make sure she stayed on message. You told me you were voting for Mr. Raisi yes. and, and that he's done good things for the country. What, yes. what things? You know, actually at first he's very honest and he cares about the poor people. But Raisi has little to offer millions of young people who long for reform the middle class hurting in an economy crippled by American sanctions. Pro-democracy activists urged them online not to vote, and it appears they stayed away in droves. This polling station in central Tehran should have closed 10 minutes ago, but authorities are so concerned about turnout that they've just decided to keep it open as long as it takes to capture every last ballot. If Raisi does squeak to victory, he'll be the first Iranian president to take office already under sanction by the United States, in part for heading the brutal crackdown on protesters in 2009. Holes in the bathroom floor and a bug infestation so bad a resident needed medical treatment. These are just some of the stories that were discovered in a Wellington flat just weeks out from new healthy home standards being introduced. The owner of the home is part of a prominent Wellington real estate agency. This is our back door, which is oh, yeah. super easy access. Piper Clear and Sam Brown live in a flat that's falling apart. This whole bit here, like, you can push that in. We were told, oh, I'll just like duct tape it up again. Kind of a sinkhole thing here. They've been here for six months with two other girls paying 870 bucks a week. It does feel kind of damp on my feet. I have thrown out a couple of pieces of clothing just because they had mold on them. One needed medical treatment for blisters caused by a suspected lax beetle infestation. She didn't want to appear on camera, but they look something like this. She couldn't like properly sit down for a while. So she'd either had to stand or like lie on her back yeah. because it hurt too much to sit. So while they were healing, they ended up getting infected. Yeah. And did she have to take antibiotics? Or yeah, yeah, she was on like a 10 day course. That's disgusting. Nobody should have to live in a place like this. And it's not just students, that's the thing. It's families, it's mm. working people. Some of the most vulnerable people in New Zealand. They leased the house through Low & Co, a realty business in the capital, boasting taglines like demand higher spec. One of its agents owns the property. That was just like a further kick in the leg. Those standards on the billboards, far from reality in this case, advocates say it's an all too common experience for renters. This is probably on the higher end of bad, um, but it's certainly not unique. So there, a lot of students are in similar situations. In a statement, Low & Co says the home hasn't been managed to its standards and accepts responsibility and apologises for inaction, including not fixing these holes in the bathroom floor, which the company said would be done by mid-March. It says it's working on a solution. This just goes to show that, you know, no matter how professional they, they claim to be, this the, the whole industry at the moment relies on exploitation of people and just, you know, it relies on keeping people in okay. conditions. Pardon me. From July, private rentals must comply to healthy home standards within 90 days of a tenancy starting. Something these girls wish had happened for them, they've taken their case to the investigations team at Tenancy Services. The World Health Organization says the Delta variant from India is well on its way to becoming the dominant strain of COVID-19 globally. 
Although the number of new COVID cases is trending downwards, this new strain is quickly making its way to all corners of the world. Scottish football fans might have been celebrating a draw in the European Championship, but everyone will be losing if there's COVID in this crowd. There's been another steep rise in cases across the UK, with the Delta variant making up around 90% of them. But it's not just the UK being impacted. The World Health Organization has today issued a warning of what is to come. The Delta variant uh, is well on its way to becoming the dominant uh, variant globally because of its uh, significantly increased uh, transmissibility. The variant has already been reported in 49 US states and is responsible for 10% of all cases in America. Germany's top public health official is warning it will take over there too. The rapid spread of the Delta variant has put the spotlight back on vaccine efficacy. Dr Paul Offit notes studies show the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine to be just 33% effective against it. The millions of people who now have only gotten one dose are at risk, especially against these variants, especially against the Delta variant. In the UK, just over 10% of people in hospital with the Delta variant have been fully vaccinated, which further backs up the claim that the vaccine is 90% effective against hospitalisation. But it's the countries without widespread vaccination programmes that has the World Health organization ringing alarm bells. The brutal reality is that in an era of multiple variants with increased transmissibility, potentially increased impact, we have left vast swathes of the population and the vulnerable population in Africa unprotected by vaccines. Africa is being closely watched by the WHO, where cases in Namibia, Sierra Leone, Liberia and Rwanda have doubled in the past week. Trukai Sports is next. Details after the break. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. PNG Palais have suffered a 48-5 defeat in their first match against Tunisia yesterday. Palais' only try was through winger Alice Alois. The second match against Jamaica was a forfeit as Jamaica withdrew from the tournament due to travel complications. Palais will play Kazakhstan today. All matches will be live streamed on all World Rugby social media channels. The Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League is poised to have all its programs in the 60-year competition structure improved in line with its new governance and management structure, the New Ireland model. Chairman of PNG RFL, Sandy Saka, says that programs will now have provincial rugby league boards to oversee the competitions across the country. The Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League has already started the reform process in line with its new governance and management structure, named the New Island Model. Under the reform process, Chairman of Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League, Sandy Saka, says provincial rugby league boards will ensure shortfalls in managing previous levels of competition, and the PNG RFL, which include the schools program, will be greatly improved. We introduced the governance and the management reforms that we are currently implementing across the country with the uh, getting the leagues to raise their standards in terms of uh, the requirements for membership and compliance to run competitions. We're setting up the provincial boards that will manage and provide oversight for local competitions at the level. We're setting up the confederate boards to manage games at the regional level and the national level. So part of the work we're doing on the governance and management reforms for the game are directed at addressing some of the shortfalls with managing the games at the grassroots level. Saka added in previous years proper management processes was lacking in the lower levels of the rugby league pathway. This included the school's rugby league program where the junior development pathway had been left without proper structures to improve the progress. But with the new governance structure, new boards will be established to oversee the lower tier programs of PNG RFL. 
work we're doing on the governance and management reforms for the game are directed at addressing some of the shortfalls with managing the games at the grassroots level. We've always said that management of the game at the elite level, the hunters' kumuls, has actually gone to a next level while the grassroots game has continued to be, you know, uh, not, unfortunately not risen up to that same bar. So we are hoping that uh, this partnership will help us grow the game, but we're in part, you know, it will run in parallel with the governance and management reforms which we are doing to improve the management of the game at that level, which we hope that, you know, they're investing money, they, ret they expect, you know, return on investment. Fidelis Sukina, Trukai Sports. Long jumper Rally Kaputin has recorded a new season's best of 6.42 meters yesterday in Townsville. Though eight meters short of her own national record of 6.50 meters recorded in 2019, Rally says she is happy. In a Facebook message, she said she had one goal and that was to jump in the 6.40s and she achieved that goal. Coming back from a cracked fibula bone injury and jumping back in the 6.40s is a huge achievement, she added. Rally is currently ranked 58 in the world and New Zealand Best is expected to push her up the ranks and that puts her in a good spot to qualify for Tokyo. Here's her jump from yesterday. The CPG's Central Dabaris yesterday went down to Lay Snacks Tigers in round three of Digicel Cup 16 to 40. The competition leaders, Tigers, with a strong forward pack, registered their third win of the season. He gets struggled in midfield. Now they... The Baris took an early lead in the first stage of the game with a warm welcome to the Lace Next Tigers. Oh, hang on. That's a try. Wow, well, from nothing. With a good kick placed in by the Baris, it was 16-4 at half time. Walk it back towards the left-hand side, kicking for the wingman. Oh, dear. Coach Gairo Pepena was impressed in the first 40 minutes, but the result didn't come out well on full time. Oh yeah, the first 40 minutes we continue to work on the style and the, the way we play, yeah, we believe in it, so I mean, but we, we couldn't uh, uh, take it on in the second half, so yeah, I thought really our defence was really poor, we, we didn't delay tackles and we gave them a lot of advantage. So. And we lost uh, in the dying, uh, crucial stages, we lost my playmaker, so I mean, yeah, we didn't have that guidance and control. In Tigers coming from behind took control of the game in the last 20 minutes of the match. So our boy is okay, all good. Play restarts. Tony, this is low. Coach Stanley Teppen was happy with the first win away from Lay. Uh, they were going to be tough, with, and they showed it today. Um, we just had to regroup at halftime, which we did, but we'll be concentrating on our starts. Uh, we're here back next week, so. Should be good for us. Uh, it's good to come out of Lay, have this win. Psychologically, it's a good advantage. Games are back on at uh, NFS, so it's good to get a feel of the ground and the wind conditions and all that sort of stuff. So it means a lot. Oh, oh no, that was expected by the call team, but not expected by Pepin the Pepin said the inclusion of some of the experienced players, including Stanley Olo, has been a boost for the team. Their contribution is, is huge, uh, their experience. Uh, they were unlucky not to go down to... Um, Australia with the rest of the Hunter squad, but having them come back, I think Stanley was uh, left out and we made a decision to get him uh, late um, and he had a good solid pre-season with us later than the others, but it's always good to have him. I think his try sort of uh, gave us a bit of breathing space, so uh, injecting him uh, at certain points of the game is really good for us. Hold on to it. Short side go. play, he is Rocky tight again, making a break. Is he Suli Suli, Trukai Sports. We'll have more sporting action after the break. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. The weather forecast for the next 24 hours when we come back. Stay tuned. True Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus, with you always.
Regional weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow. In the southern region, Port Moresby, mostly fine and partly cloudy. Daru, partly cloudy. Partly cloudy with few showers for Kerama, Popondeta and Alotau, few showers. In the Mumase region, Vanimo, partly cloudy. Medang and Wiwek, partly cloudy with few showers tonight. Lei, partly cloudy with few showers. To the New Guinea Islands region, Loringao, cloudy periods. Partly cloudy with a shower or two for Kavieng, Kokopo and Rabaul, partly cloudy with few showers. Kimbe and Buka, partly cloudy. And to the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, partly cloudy with brief showers. Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, partly cloudy with few showers. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for today, Sunday, the 20th of June 2021. From all of us here at MTV, have a safe working week, pleasant viewing, good night. <laughs>